Uh, hello, everyone. I'm very happy that we have Frida Barnek here and Daniel Knorr, two of the artists that are involved in a public project in front of the Bass Museum. Uh, you can see a picture with Daniel Knorr's piece in the front and Frida Barnek's. You can hardly see it. It feels a little pixelated, but it's on the left. Here we go. Let me say a few words about the park and the project, and then I want to hand over to the artists that they can also talk a little bit about their practice and the work they created for public uh, this year and the relation between uh, the practice and the work. So I've seen like many of the former contributions the last couple of years in front of the Bass Museum and elsewhere in the city. And I always felt, I mean, first of all, whenever you go to an art fair, you feel uh, overwhelmed in a way and too distracted. And I felt it's kind of important to narrow it down to a digestible format. And so I decided to A, come up with a thematic uh, point of view. And the exhibition is called Territorial. And also to have like lesser artists, only 11 compared to last year's edition, for example, that were, um, I think they had like 25 or 28 artists. But you know, um, it's also thinking about public, which is this hybrid format between an art fair and an exhibition. So you have to go back and forth and figure out what are the constraints in the beginning, because half of the artists are probably um, come from like applications, galleries apply with, with a specific artist, and then you look it through and you have to think, does it make sense, or you want to encourage the galleries to come up with someone else, or with a different project. And some of the projects or some of the artists I approach directly and encourage them to do a piece. So for example, the big, for those of you who have seen the exhibition this year, I, I contacted Daniel Buren who did like the major piece, like as the, you know, as the kind of architectural, but also um, maybe metaphorical spine of the exhibition called Territorial in the Middle. And he recreated the piece from 1982 that he did for Documenta in Kassel on the Friedericianum, uh, right in front of the Friedericianum. And you hear this loud classical music. Um, it's uh, very powerful. And then you have like many other works that kind of deal with the notion of territorial. Territorial deal deals like on one hand with territory, because of course we have to ask ourselves what is the public, especially in the US, because many of these public squares and public places are privatized. This park is public and it belongs to the museum. And of course, territorial also refers to artistic practices of the 60s, that artists that left the confines of the museum, like Daniel Buren or land artists who went out to the park and realized new projects. But it also talks about the self-confidence of sculpture to claim space in a very physical space. So all this, uh, you know, is in this title, and I think it kind of runs through the entire exhibition on a very loose level, like as a loose thread. And there are many various contributions with, um, like, a very diverse artist crowd and diverse generations in there. And I'm very happy that I have both of you, and maybe. Um, you should talk about your work. Maybe we start with you, Frida. Frida was born in Rio de Janeiro, but she m and has lived all over Europe and New York and all over the place and moved to Miami about a year ago. And um, yeah, so maybe exactly. And I asked the artist because I always feel it's abstract. If you didn't have a chance to see the park and the artists talk about work that you can't see, it feels a little awkward, so I encourage the artists to bring some images also of other works to give you an idea uh, what their practice is about. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think I will just start um, talking a little bit about uh, this work, which, um, which is, um, well, I won't. I'm going to start talking about this. Um, so this is an installation uh, that I did in 84 in Rio de Janeiro. I had just uh, graduated from architecture school and I started to work as an artist. And um, I, I very early on um, 
accepted that everything I saw was a convention and I had um, a feeling that I had to transform it. And that was, that started happening with the landscape in the Rio where I lived. Uh, so I made this um, circular tube of plastic like a boy and I, I took it to the lake uh, in the center of Rio and I put around this rock where I embodied the, the rock um, and it became, um, you know, like a body and floating instead of the notion of being a rock. Uh, so there I transformed the material just the way you look at it. Um, then in the next uh, slide, um, the next one, I then took this same boy and I put inside uh, a swimming pool in a very important exhibition that happened in the 80s in Rio called uh, 80s Generation. And the boy was inflated with water inside the water. And what happened was that you look at this uh, mirror that reflected the whole building and it felt like you were underwater looking up. So I changed the whole architecture of the place just with that element. Um, then uh, we're just gonna go quickly in the loop. I think uh, this was my first solo show and I, outside the gallery, I just uh, brought this rock and, you know, I just looked at the tree and the, the tree had this perfect shape of a catapult and I couldn't resist, I had to make one, um, and that was the size of it, and it stayed there for the whole length of the exhibition. And then I started to work um, with metal. Uh, so it was in the late 80s that I really felt that I was occupying space um, with the materials and transforming the way, um, you know, very much uh, in a poetic, uh, can you change please? In a poetic uh, way, you know, you have several samples of my work where I just work with very simple materials and industrial materials that were available to me. I was young and didn't have a lot of resources. Um, but um, in all those works, um, the main, uh, the main concern was uh, to create or recreate different poetic relationships between the materials. And then, you know, we would see something different. Um, those are more samples of the work. Uh, okay, here was a, a different thing that happened. Um, I was invited to participate in a Big, big exhibition at the MoMA in 93. And um, I asked if I could do a special installation and they said yes. And I uh, got hold of um, those airplane parts that were uh, surplus from, in, from the military industry in America. And there was a lot of talk about it. I, I was in a fellowship uh, here in America. And um, I ended up make, making this piece, um, which was uh, like a ton of steel and all those airplane parts. Um, um, so I, I started to vary a lot uh, after that with other materials and other situations. Um, this were, this were, those works were more visceral. Um, they were done in Paris after I had my uh, first child and they very much explored um, the liquid and sculpture being liquid. Um, those um, were done in Berlin when I lived there and there was, um, it was a lot about psychological space and relationships between uh, materials and the body and the passage. Those were more samples of, you know, sometimes I use image of um, objects 
everyday objects, but I take away the function of them and I create some other kind of relationship uh, just through materials, always through materials. Um, this is a recent work, just for you to have an idea what I've been, what I'm doing now. Um, it's just metal and wood, and I am exploring a lot those uh, uncertainty relations um, and through the material. Um, so I'll just talk a bit quickly about the um, uh, reflections on the horizon, which is the work that is in the park. Um, it's really uh, one of the first times I use uh, color, and here I use color uh, to transform, to transform what we see, to transform what we feel when we look out. Um, and, and that was a fantastic experience for me, uh, and I felt um, I... I explore something that I have not explored uh, before. Uh, it has a lot to do with um, territory in a way, because territory is space. And um, here we have uh, everything else that is not space and occupies space is a representation. It's an illusion. And so with this work, uh, I explore a lot this idea of what's real, what's an illusion. Um, and that's, you know, that's what the work, the experience with the work um, gives. And it's really great. Like at the park, you can see that there's so many uh, visitors and also school classes at the moment, and they pick it up. It's the only participatory piece in the exhibition. Daniel, do you want to join us again? <laughs> Frida, thank you so much. Um, Maybe let's, yeah, let's switch over to you and then we can talk about, uh, or we have, might have questions afterwards. Daniel Knorr uh, was originally born in Romania and then when he was 14, he moved with his parents to Germany and since then he has lived in Berlin with some interruptions in the US, I guess, in, in New York. And his practice has always um, been in close relation also to the site and to the place where he created the work. But Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you, Philip. Um, oh, ex again, exactly. And we should mention that Daniel's work, you might have seen it at Documenta. There was one piece, and you might talk about that, the yeah. smoke piece that announced Documenta in Kassel at the Frideriziano. Many people thought the Frideriziano is on fire and were concerned, but um, you will talk about it, I hope. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Philip. And also thank you for the invitation. And, uh, joining us here this afternoon. Um, so I'm talking first about uh, a piece that uh, I started like 10 years ago and culminated uh, in Athens uh, for the Documenta 14. And um, this, uh, you can see a pile of, uh, uh, let's say, found objects from the street. And I'm gonna, you know, show with the hand like this and then this means like we, we go to the next slide. Cool. Um, so, yeah, um, and then these objects were pressed into books and uh, with, you know, 50 tons and um, you can see the, it's like a production street from where like objects uh, get minimized and, and then insert into the book and then pressed and the print run was about, um, yeah, uh, you, 1,500 objects. This is, you can see different objects that are inside. And, um, and uh, on the last page, there is a, a USB stick with a film. And uh, actually this project uh, paid this other project, which is, uh, uh, this is a manifesto, and it shows uh, um, the idea also. Um, uh, it's called expiration movement, and um, uh, the idea was to to produce smoke from the uh, uh, Friderizianum from the Zverenturm, which is like a tower of this building. It's uh, the oldest um, museum in in Germany, um, 
it comes, it's, uh, it's the place of Documenta. And um, so this went for 163 days uh, during opening hours of the show. And uh, so 10 hours per day. We spent like every day about $600 that <laughs> were smoked, let's say. And the money we got from the production of the books, we sold the books in Athens and in, in Kassel. So um, we can go to the next piece. So I'm jumping now to another body of work. I'm a conceptual artist and actually work with ideas that ma materialize. This was for a Biennale in um, uh, Copenhagen where uh, I did this piece which was called Stolen History. So actually it took the size of different monuments of the head of those monuments and produced these um, masks and put them for one day over, over the, the sculptures. And then you can see like even quite high, I went there up there and put them on the top. So we were like a team of five, five teams of each two, three people. And the idea is also that you can see history from a different angle. From some, Churchill was a liberator. For the others, it was uh, somebody who took over. So history is also, you see, it, you see the history with a different eye. And also, the idea is also to remark those um, um, monuments who we don't, which we don't see anymore, like when we pass. Uh, this one was called Generations, Lifting Generations. I found it in the middle of the city. But then you can understand also somehow how this piece actually evolves and gets materialized. Another piece uh, I did like uh, an explosion. It stayed for two years in, in the city of Vienna. Um, it's made of stainless steel wool. And it shows the moment where uh, uh, actually an explosion erupts and it's just about to destroy everything, but it's not really destroying, it's just a moment that is, let's, let's say, after it, it went off. And it's like the moment, I felt it's like the moment where we are now, that we actually cannot do anything anymore to stop it, but we are just around it and, and feel how it actually will damage. And this is the next, please. This is a piece that I did in Rotterdam in 2000. It's, I set this on the top of a mill for uh, two hours and to take this photograph. And this is another piece in, um, it's an older piece from 98 in Marseille. And this is a snowman uh, in Nice. Uh, it's made of uh, stones from the beach. And um, then the next one, you see the, the, uh, the, the sea in the same time, the, the, uh, the Mediterranean sea. And uh, this piece is in Sunny Isles. I'll build, I built it, it's a permanent piece that was built in front of a Herzog de Meuron building. And it uh, just opened this week. And this opened, yeah, together, yeah, on the 5th. It, uh, so you're free to go there. It's uh, called Jade Signature, the building, and uh, it's open for public. It's actually, if you see the next, it's, it's on, the, uh, on the beach, and it's made of gemstones. Uh, the idea was actually to use gemstones um, from the idea, like from where all the inhabitants of um, Miami come, like they're from 150 nations, and also those stones from, come from all over the world. So it was the idea of reuniting them on this body of the snowman. And the next piece is uh, the piece that uh, I produced for... Uh, Philip uh, for his show Territory and I'm very uh, happy and proud to be part of this show, uh, with a brilliant show and I um, uh, was happy to install this piece there. Uh, it's a piercing that is that pierced the earth and actually, yeah, um, it's, you know, setting a point, saying it's called Navel of the World so it's actually talking also about the moment of Art Basel being here, but also of the moment of a museum. And uh, we have a lot of relations that we can read into it. And then the next photograph is, you can see together with the Daniel Buren. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a happy image, let's say. 
And uh, well, this is, you know, about my work, what I can, you know. Yeah, thank you so much. I think the really nice thing is when you go to the park um, to see the navel of the world next to the Daniel Buren. I mean, they're both, the Daniel Buren has this festive music and this little pennants, you know, that look like a car, car dealership or like an art fiesta. And it's kind of Basel, Art Basel coming here like for a week and then going somewhere else. And we have to take it down. We have to take down the artworks on Monday, except it looks like the Daniel Buren is going to stay a little longer. And uh, we're very happy about that. Thank you so much for presenting your work. Maybe we should talk about, we call this conversation, or I called it, public territories. Um, and you know, when I, what I heard now, I know that you, Frida, your practice has been, um, the participatory aspect of your work has been very important. And of course, it, your practice also relates to the 60s and to other artists who were focusing these aspects in their work, and there's a tradition in Brazilian art when you think of Ligia Pape and others. So in order to enable participation, you're, you need public space or you need the public dialogue conversation. What does it mean for you? Do you make a distinction between the works that are autonomous sculptures and others that have to be activated? Um. Yeah, in fact, um, I find it uh, more rewarding when I work um, in a public space, in a way, because um, you don't control who sees it. Uh, everybody sees it. Um, everybody can uh, have a participation, even if it's just to look at it. Um, I find that... Um, it's also interesting um, to do projects that are in, you know, in such a scale. Uh, unfortunately, you know, unless you, it's something quite simple that you can just go there and do it, you need um, a lot more <laughs> uh, of uh, a project and a budget to be able to realize it. Um, but I find that um, sometimes, uh, it's actually, you know, especially in now that uh, we are becoming so careful with everything, you know, and less spontaneous. Um, I think we we actually should try to do more of those actions uh, that are more spontaneous, less planned, um, less d divisive. Is between, yeah, between you know, big productions and simple productions. Maybe a question for you, Daniel. You know, when I put together territorial, uh, I always thought, you know, you start to think, what is sculpture? And public is not only, we also have a video in there by Cipriya Gayar, for example, in order to show that public is not only a sculptural ghetto, but of course, when you think about sculpture, you, I always think of Ad Reiner, the painter who said, when you look, sculpture, you know, lies on the ground, and when you look at the painting, you, uh, you bump into a sculpture, when you back up to look at the painting, that's what sculpture is. And sculpture is, of course, much more about uh, than that. Sculpture claims a territory, claims a space. And I feel it's interesting that there are many pieces in the exhibition, Ito Barada's piece, your piece, that deal with the notion of the monument and kind of try to revitalize the monument that is, you know, wasn't so attractive in the second half of the 20th century because there was nothing to represent, no more ideologies. But it's interesting that there is an entire generation, your work, but also Abraham Cruz Viegas, for example, um, the Mexican artist who created a wonderful piece, uh, you know, argues also within the confines of the monument. And when I look at your practice, for example, the permanent explosion in Vienna, you've realized a lot of um, monuments in public space. And many monuments that you have realized in the past um, deal with the notion of the ephemeral or are extremely ephemeral. How do you see the piercing or in general the ephemeral in relation to the notion of the monument? Yeah, uh, 
Yeah, difficult question, to be honest. <laughs> so, but um, I think ephemeral is something that um, has to be renewed in a way. This is how I understand it also. Like something, if it needs to be sustained, it needs to be renewed every day. So on one hand, it's uh, interesting because uh, it is something that you have to keep up, so you have to take care of, uh, like the smoke or other, you know, um, like also the in the same time this piece with the explosion, I had also to go there and take care of it. You know, like uh, in winter there was snow on it, and then when it when the snow came down, it also it was it looked a little bit deranged. So I had to <coughs> put up the hair again. You know, but um, it's interesting because it's like you need like a manager, or we we are like a, the managers around it. So it's not like a sculpture like that is in public space and there's dust over it and actually you don't need to do nothing. Um, but in the same time, it has to do with the tradition. So it's actually, it can be also, it can fall into this, it, it can become a traditional, let's say, taking care of. And this is what we have well to... Well, that's the practical aspect, yeah. but I also mean, you know, the snowman is technically melting. It's yeah. not melting because it's a monument or it's a sculpture. Yeah. The smoke piece, the permanent ex explosion, or the smoke piece are all like, you know, like photographs or like frozen, frozen pictures. And maybe we also need to talk about uh, talking about the frozen moments, about your potholes that you have realized in the past, also here in Miami, and you can also see some uh, at the fair. Ah, yeah, there were some. I totally forgot. I think there were some <laughs> slides I forgot. And he's um, very well known for these kind of uh, works. So. Okay, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So this, the um, the potholes are actually pieces where I take the form of uh, potholes from the street and cast them, and uh, you know, like uh, I use a material that it's made from. You know, it's an American material made for the creative industries. So it comes in the colors of the moment. Let's say the colors that also institutions and companies use. So the reflection of on them, it's um, it's using these materials, and uh, it's like there are like gaps, but uh, you know they are made in into into this body, which is like the 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 ground, which it's let's say the streets are a kind of a biopolitical uh, phenomena. It's they are made in order to for us to function in a better way, but we use them so we make holes in it and. It's a uh, like a, a common, let's say, uh, a common trace, and that I, I actually take away and and fill it with content. So you can see this in uh, in the art fair. I, I have different works that I produced here in um, in Miami, and uh, you can see them in booths uh, B12 and G21. <laughs> I don't know, I'm maybe is this the moment to open up the discussion? Do you have questions to the artists or about the show? I think uh, just I could say something about what we were just talking that some, you know, one uh, important aspect I think in, in our works is also the process. And, um, you know, sometimes people uh, go see a sculpture or a painting, whatever, and you're seeing something that is done, but in fact, it's not done. You know, also seeing and experiencing it, it's part of the process um, that we started. And it's also a process that can never be completed in the end, No, right? never. Or it doesn't need to be completed. Yeah, it's a continuous, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, to the Brazilian lady, uh, you mentioned that your earlier works on water, I think it's in the, the Rio de Janeiro Bay area, yeah. um, were um, a comment on poetry, and that in that way your, your work can be seen as a monument to poetry. However, your later works are, I would say, distance from poetry and more to, to the distraction and comments on, on anything that is far from poetry. 
So can you elaborate a little bit? Yes. Um, I work very intuitively and um, intuition being um, my emotions and my thoughts, um, but in a very unconscious way. So in fact, uh, when um, I'm making work, I'm not really thinking, I'm just making. Um, whatever I read um, from the work, I read it after I make it. Um, and many times, I don't even know what I made. Um, I learn after it's done, and I learn through others um, who saw it. Um, it's, um, I just found that um, it's not about poetry, it's about poetic relationships. Um, and all the work also um, has a relationship with the body, being body as a being. Um, so that is more the relationships that I'm talking about and not a literal you know, connection to poetry. Thank you. Thank you. Does it work? Yeah. OK. Thank you. Uh, my question is addressed to Daniel. Um, but Frida, you're also welcome to, to answer it. The question is about the tension between um, concept, working as a conceptual artist and accessibility. When you do um, works for the public, for open space, for the public space, uh, work uh, not dedicated to be shown within the walls of art spaces, do you think about the degree of accessibility to, to a larger audience, not, an audience not necessarily educated in art? Uh, yeah, uh, if I understand your question, is about the sensibility to make the work uh, also for the audience outside of the art world. Um, I think, yeah, for me, it's like the, the most uh, important let's say, a uh, moment that uh, the, the work, you know, when it's in public, it's actually, um, it's like an exam, you know, it's like, it's where it it's get examined by, by the world, by the people that are around. And um, I think it has to function also, and or it has to function very good. And I'm super happy when people are going around and photographing and Instagramming, and also like examining and telling me, yeah, I like your piece. And the, the reaction of the people, uh, it's, it's really the number one. Um, and later comes actually, let's say, the examination through the professionals. Uh, and I'm always happy if, if, you know, like, let's say people also like that live in this park come and say, hey, I like your piece. It's, it's super nice. Yeah, maybe I also have to say, Daniel was the first in, first artist that I invited to the project, and it was a coincidence because I ran into him last year, and I knew I'm gonna do that, and I like his work, and I talked about my idea of territorial, so I was very happy when he came up with this sculpture, which is of course highly specific to the theme, because the the sculpture refers to, you know, uh, when you think of Piero Manzoni's famous piece Socle du Monde, it refers to that. It gives like the navel of the world um, claims like a site or a place or it claims a center and transform the entire park into a body technically or into like a horizon or landscape and that's maybe one of the reasons I don't think that might be one of the reasons why you're asking the question because the accessibility because it is so specific to the theme but I think the reason for that was we had the discussion before I started and it wasn't so much the accessibility of the shiny metal, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah, excuse me, one last word I wanted to say, like, I think I make uh, more uh, the pieces for the people than for the art world, to be honest. Like uh, the piece in Copenhagen, for example, it was made for the audience and, I, later, I, I discovered in the newspaper that is largely printed, uh, like the newspaper of the 
subway, the subway news, it, it has a huge print run, and they photographed like uh, two sculptures that were covered, and then they asked, what is this? They didn't know if it's an art piece or is it a rev revolutionary act? What's going on? So, but it was in the newspaper, so they discovered it somehow. And I think uh, it's really interesting for me to use, as uh, my colleague uh, also pointed out, the, the moment of uncertainty. And that's, I think, something that we have to look for, uh, the uncertainty in, in our future, not the security, just the opposite. Um, I think also that um, uh, we as artists, we are lucky to be beyond branding, you know, we don't make work to be, you know, um, for a specific public or a specific uh, reason. Um, it, it goes a lot beyond that. Um, and for example, in this uh, work that, I, you know, the fact that I chose um, the plexiglass and the transparency, the color as transparency, um, you know, the transparency gives depth and um, it also reflects um, the image of who is looking. So um, the subject and the object uh, becomes one thing. Uh, so you have, you know, like, um, in those situations that you create and you create them and some things happen that you have not thought about before. It's just that the work informs you. Once you, you made the piece, you made the work, it gives you a lot more information than you thought you know, previously when you started working on, on the piece. One more question. Curious if if you have um, gotten your uh, art uh, background and education in Romania and Brazil during the brutal dictatorship years. Yes, I was born um, as a child. Um, my whole childhood until um, like the last year of. Um, um, of the last year of university, I lived through dictatorship. Uh, that was uh, my reality. Um, and um, it was quite tough. Uh, it was a different life. There was no freedom. Uh, there was no freedom of expression. And a lot of people disappeared. Um, there was a lot of violence. Um, it was a, a very, very different time, and I actually participated um, in the first manifestation that happened for the first direct elections for president, um, and I was then on my early 20s. Daniel, do you want to say something about it? Uh, uh, you asked me too, also, about my... I was actually, I left when I was a teenager, and uh, so as a teenager, you are in between, uh, you know, uh, a dream life and a uh, real life. So actually I saw it as a child, let's say, more or less. And um, so I didn't know what's, you know, other situations. So I j it, it was the reality for me. And um, I mean, sure, everything was m more, you know, uh, was a big oppression. You had a lot of things you have to do but in the same time we, we we took our freedom ourselves so we get we found gaps where we can i mean fool the system or stuff like that so we were just you know uh this is what we did all the time we tried to find gaps and you know go around it and uh when i arrived to germany i i was you know impressed by uh the moment that people actually don't go around things and don't try to find gaps and everything is very organized so <laughs> uh yeah i don't know uh it was it was a uh, let's say um quite uh interesting moment but uh yeah i i think the freedom you have to take your freedom somehow by yourself
and that's it. Well, I think that's a nice conclusion. And for those of you, so I encourage you, for those of you, of you who haven't seen Territorial the, at Public Sector at Collins Park, please go see and uh, see the exhibition. It looks really great at night. And I think it ends at 8 o'clock, so you might have time. Frida, thank you so much. Daniel, thank you so much. And thank you so much for coming. Have a good night. <laughs>